Well, good morning, church family. This is the day that the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome home. Welcome to the one place you can come no matter where you are, no matter what's going on in life, and know that you are loved. I want to invite you to, to open your Bibles with me to the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 11, verses 18 to 21. Follow along. You shall put these words of mine in your heart and soul, and you shall bind them as a sign on your head and fix them as an emblem on your forehead. Teach them to your children, talking about them when you're at home and when you're away, when you lie down and when you ride, when you rise. Write them on the doorposts of your houses and on your gates so that your days and the days of your children may be multiplied in the land that the Lord swore to your ancestors to give them as long as the heavens are above the earth. These are the words of God for us, the people of God. Let us praise God together. These words are written all the way back, all the way so very, very long ago. And they are still as relevant to us today as when they were written, as when they were spoken by Moses to the people of Israel getting ready to, to enter into the Holy Land. It's amazing what God wants to do in us, wants to do for us, and wants to do through us. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. We thank you for today. We thank you for all the provisions you've provided for us, God. We thank you for the beauty of your creation. We thank you for our health. We thank you for our families. We thank you for this body. And God, help us to focus on you. Help us to worship you. Help us to show you your worth to us today. God, take all those other things that are pulling for our attention and help us to set them aside right now. Help us to focus on you. Because God, you are wonderful. And God, we know that we are so not worthy of all you've given us. God, we know that our worth is found in you and that you have made us worthy. So God, out of the appreciation for, for who you are, for what you've done, help us to live lives of living sacrifices set apart for you. And we ask all this in your son Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. All right, brothers and sisters, let's sing a song of praise. Show. 
couple announcements uh, for us today. Uh, I will not be at Augie's again this Tuesday. Um, due to illness in our house, uh, I am still not supposed to be around people. Um, and if everything goes right, this next Sunday we're going to have someone else here physically in the building to bring us a good word from God. I, I don't know who that is as of yet, uh, but we're working on that. Um, so hopefully we will be meeting this next Sunday in person. Uh, if that's the case, then you should receive an email from me this next week uh, letting you know that that's taking place. Um, but we're hopeful. So uh, hoping that you can all be here this next Sunday to, to join together and worship God. Um, that takes us to our time of uh, receiving the offering. Um, now obviously we're not receiving it right now, uh, but... We give out of what God has done for us. Not out of obligation, but out of love. But we don't just give financially. While we do give financially, we should also be giving of our time, of our talents, of the things that God has gifted us with to turn and share with the world in desperate need of his good news. If you want to give through the ministry of this church, uh, you should be able to do that. Uh, you should see a, a thing on your screen right now. Uh, go ahead and take your smartphone out, and you can scan it with the camera, and it'll take you to a link to give. Uh, or you can send it in uh, through, you know, the old-fashioned way, mail. Uh, you can send that to P.O. Box 582, Orofino, Idaho, 83544. And that's to the Orofino Church of the Nazarene. Um, let's go ahead and pray over our offering now. Father God, we thank you. We thank you that, that even when we don't feel like we're blessed, God, we know that we are. God, we have been blessed so richly, so abundantly. So Father, help us to give back. Help us to give to further your kingdom here in Orofino, here in the United States, and here in the world. God, there are so many who need to hear of your good news. And so, God, may, may this offering go to further your kingdom. We love you, Lord. In your holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right.
Well, let's stand and sing another song of praise.
Good morning. Good morning to everyone out there watching this morning. Good morning to all the kiddos that are watching this morning. I miss you all. Um, but soon we'll be able to gather together and worship. I appreciate you tuning in this morning. I have a little mini message in regard to chapter 15 of Acts. Pastor Shane is going to be sharing uh, much in this chapter 15 of the book of Acts in God's Word, the Holy Bible. But um, today, I just want to share with you that um, Acts 15 talks about the first meeting of the church leaders. Now remember, the church in Jerusalem was all of the believers, not necessarily a building. But Paul and Barnabas were sent out, as we know in previous chapters, they were sent out to share the good news of Jesus Christ far away to many people most of them not Jewish. And so when they returned home, as we talked about last week, there they met, they were met with a problem. People shared with them that the Jewish believers thought that the non-Jewish believers, the Gentiles, should follow all of the old Jewish laws that God had set forth before he sent his son, Jesus Christ. So Paul and Barnabas and the rest of the apostles, the leaders of that new church in Jerusalem, they got together and had a meeting. So chapter 15 is about that very first meeting. So Paul and Paul and Barnabas had just returned home from their adventure, and then they had to deal with this little problem. Now, now some of the people had, as you know that we talked about, had followed Paul and, and Barnabas and tried to tell people that what they were sharing wasn't true. Well, some of the people that were saying that the non-Jewish people should follow all of the Jewish laws as well, or some of the same people. Well, the leaders got together, and they prayed, and they knew because of Jesus Christ's sacrifice on the cross, his death, his resurrection, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit in our lives, that all those laws weren't necessary anymore. But they also knew, I believe, that people are comfortable with a few rules. So they set some rules that followed some guidelines that God had set for the Jewish people. And as you read chapter 15, and those of you who share with your families chapter 15, you will read what some of those very basic, simple rules were. So all the people, all the believers in Jerusalem were told about this. And then a letter was sent out to all of the believers that were in all of the cities that Paul and Barnabas had visited. And all those people then also knew what the church leaders were sharing with them. The important thing about chapter 15 is, is to remember that when you believe in God and you have Jesus Christ as your Savior and the Holy Spirit guides your life, that there are more do's than don'ts. But it's also important to remember, like the Ten Commandments, they kind of help us remember what's right and what's wrong as well. So as you read chapter 15, I don't want you to be confused about all those rules that you're not supposed to do because God had set those things up for the Jewish people. 
I want you to remember that when you pray and you talk to God and you trust Jesus, the Holy Spirit will help you make a decision on what's right and wrong. And as you start school next week, I know this will be very helpful to you. So I want to encourage you to always pray and always ask God what his rules for you are, the things he would have you do. And when you do, the don'ts just don't happen very much. So I would like to pray for you for this week, all you kiddos. It's going to be a very exciting week next week. Every head bowed, every eye closed. Father and God, I just thank you. Thank you for Jesus Christ, our Savior. Thank you for the help of the Holy Spirit. And Father, every child out there, those that are watching, those that are listening, Father, help them this coming week as they step into their schools, as they are excited to meet their teachers and see their friends and meet new friends. And then, Father, as always, keep them, keep them safe. Help them to talk to you. Help them to listen so they'll know what rules you have for them, the do's, and then sometimes the don'ts. And we just ask these things in Jesus' precious name. And all God's children said, Amen. Thank you, Miss Tammy, for that amazing mini message. Uh, you know, we're going to go to prayer here in just just a second. Uh, but I want you kids to know that we are praying for you as you get ready to go back to school this week. Um, Oh, my goodness, we have parents who are super excited for it, parents who are a little nervous, uh, but you are being prayed for. You're being prayed for by your family, by your parents, by, by your church family, and, and by those who love you and desire what's good for you. So let's go to God in prayer. Lord, we lift up those kids who are beginning uh, to get ready to go back to school. For a lot of them, God, they are super excited to go back to school. And for some of them, they're a bit nervous. And so, God, I pray that you would, would temper the, the nerves. God, would you help them to, to find peace in you? God, help these young ones to, to be prepared for school, to go and to shine your light everywhere that they go. And God, help them to bear witness to you, to their friends, to, to the kids that they may not necessarily like, and God, to their teachers, to everyone they come into contact with. God, help them to be your hands and feet. Just because they're small does not mean they cannot make a big impact. And God, we pray for, for the administrators. We pray for the uh, administration. We pray for the paraprofessionals, the bus drivers, the, the school lunch workers, God, for, the, for all of those who, who are taking part in the education of our young ones. God, may, may your love abound in their hearts. May your peace be expressed through them to others. May your shalom, your wholeness, your completeness be evident in the ways in which they carry themselves, the ways in which they interact with others. And Father, we know that in the last couple of weeks, things have gotten seemingly crazy. With Haiti and the earthquakes there and 2,000 people having lost their lives, God, we lift up the Haitian people to you, our brothers and sisters. And God, we pray, we pray for your mighty hand to be evident to them. Because God, we know that your mighty hand is there. But God, give them eyes to see you. And God, we pray for, for those especially right now in Afghanistan. God, we pray for our Christian brothers and sisters there, but God, we pray for everyone that's there. God, for those, for those who, are, who are giving others a hard time, for those who who out of hatred, out of anger, are striking out. 
we pray for them, God. May they come to know who you are. And God, in some of those cases, God, may, it'll probably be through the, the very people that, that they're persecuting. So God, help them to shine your light. And God, help them to be receptive to what it is you're doing. God, you desire that none would be lost. And so, Father, we pray for your peace, for your shalom, for your wholeness to be poured out over that entire region. God, may your mercy be evident. May your grace be evident be abounding, and God, may your love be seen for what it is, the love of a father for his children. Father, our hearts are hurting for, for our brothers and sisters, for those around the world who are struggling right now, and so God, help us to truly be a people of prayer, coming to you day and night. Whenever the thought hits us, and even when it doesn't, God, drive that thought into our heads to help us keep coming to you, lifting up one another. God, most of all, we pray for your will to be done. God, may your will be done in, in, in our hearts, in our lives, in our families, in our church, in our community, and around the world. God, we ask this in your son Jesus' mighty resurrected name. Amen. In debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to discuss this question with the apostles and the elders. So they were sent on their way by the church, and as they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, they reported the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the believers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles, and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the sect of the Pharisees stood up and said, it is necessary for them to be circumcised in order to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and the elders met together to consider this matter. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, my brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that I should be the one through whom the Gentiles would hear the message of the good news and become believers. And God, who knows the human heart, testified to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And in cleansing their hearts by faith, he has made no distinction between them and us. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing on the necks of the disciples a yoke that neither our ancestors nor we have been able to bear? On the contrary... We believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. The whole assembly kept silence and listened to Barnabas and Paul as they told of all the signs and wonders that God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they had finished speaking, James replied, My brothers, listen to me. Simeon has related how God first looked favorably on the Gentiles to take from, them, to take from among them a people for his name. This agrees with the words of the prophets as it is written. After this, I will return, and I will rebuild the dwelling of David, which has fallen. From its ruins, I will rebuild it, and I will set it up. So that all other people may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles over whom my name has been called. Thus says the Lord, who has been making these things known from long ago. Therefore, I have reached the decision that we should not trouble those Gentiles who are turning to God, but we should write to them to abstain only from things polluted by idols and from fornication and from whatever has been strangled and from blood. For in every city, for generations past, Moses has had those who proclaimed him, for he has been read aloud every Sabbath in the synagogues. Then the apostles and the elders, with the consent of the whole church, decided to choose men from among their members and to send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. They sent Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, leaders among the brothers. With the following letter, the brothers, both the apostle and the elders, to the believers of Gentile origin in Antioch and Syria and Cecilia, Cilicia, greetings. Since we have heard that certain persons who have gone out from us Though with no 
instructions from us have said things to disturb you and have unsettled your minds. We have decided unanimously to choose representatives and send them to you, along with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, who have risked their lives for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to impose on you no further burden than these essentials, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what is strangled and from fornication. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. Farewell. So they were sent off and went down to Antioch. When they gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. When its members read it, they rejoiced at the exhortation. Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, said much to encourage and strengthen the believers. After they had been there for some time, they were sent off in peace by the believers to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, and there, with many others, they taught and proclaimed the word of the Lord. After some days, Paul said to Barnabas, Come, let us return and visit the believers in every city where we proclaim the word of the Lord and see how they are doing. Barnabas wanted to take with them John called Mark, but Paul decided not to take with them to not take with them one who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not accompanied them in the work. The disagreement became so sharp that they parted company. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus, but Paul chose Silas and set out, the believers commending him to the grace of the Lord. He went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Praise be to God. Oh my goodness, what an interesting story about the early church. The word of God had just spread to the Gentiles, to the non-Jews, to the people from the other lands, and they've responded incredibly enthusiastically to its message. There were thrilling stories of healing, of miracles, and of dramatic conversions. Now, these new converts were in love with God and filled with joy because their sins had been forgiven. And they'd experienced the presence of God in their lives. They were also enjoying the fellowship of other people who had received the Lord Jesus Christ into their lives. And and they were growing in the faith with them. Even the persecution they faced from friends and family didn't cause them to reconsider the decisions they had made to follow Christ. But then something happened. Uh, that they weren't prepared for. A small group of of, of zealous Jewish Christians from Jerusalem came to pay them a visit. Uh, They were born Jews and had carefully followed the Jewish faith, observing the law of Moses and the traditions of Judaism. Now, they had accepted Christ as their Messiah, and they had assumed that they should continue to follow all of the Jewish laws and traditions. And to some extent, they were right at least according to the moral code. Uh, But Jewish tradition had interpreted Mosaic law and had added so much to it. And so when these Jewish Christians came to Antioch, uh, they they tried to impose these rules on the new Christians who who hardly knew uh, who Moses was. The first thing they said to these new Christians was, unless you're circumcised according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This was not exactly good news, especially to the adult male Gentile converts. Instead of helping to open up the way to Christ, these people were putting obstacles in the way. They made the way to God more difficult instead of more accessible. They they were creating these unnecessary obstacles instead of removing them. This often happens in the life of a new Christian. Uh, Some people feel that it's their business to remind them of the prohibitions, the the, the no things in life, the things that we're not supposed to do anymore. And and so they place these shackles around the feet of these new Christians so they can't walk with the Christ in the new life that that has been given to them through him. Uh, They become the religious police, you know, investigating new believers to, to make sure they're not doing anything wrong. 
Now, it's important for those new believers to understand that when they come to Christ, it it means a whole new way of living, a whole new way of thinking, and that there are rules, there are laws in place that that we do need to observe, but you don't have to make it so that, that they can't be saved. They can't be made right with God by keeping just rules. They made it seem like a person's relationship with God was dependent on how well they kept the law rather than on the gift of his grace through the Lord Jesus. Legalism is, is seeing the Christian life as, as a list of things to do and an equal, if not larger, list of things not to do. It makes it appear that, that, that we're justified before God by our obedience, not by what he has done for us. You can't earn your salvation. It's a free gift from God. And legalism sees the Christian life as a list of rules rather than spiritual principles that enable us to to enter into kingdom life. Legalism majors on prohibitions rather than emphasizing the positive transformation that takes place through Jesus. Legalism looks at the letter of the law rather than at the spirit and the heart of the law. It looks more towards the outward observances rather than an inner change in our heart. Legalism legalism is a problem in the church because it's not authentic Christianity. Now, why is legalism such a problem in the church? Now, now there's several reasons for this, but I think the first one is, is that legalism takes a relationship of love and turns it into a religion of laws. You see, primarily, our relationship with God is supposed to be a relationship of love, not just an adherence to a set of rules. Uh, Now, I want to be careful here uh, because we live in a society which often has the opposite problem than what we're talking about today. In our culture, we have overemphasized grace to the point that that many people seem to to feel that that obedience to a moral code isn't necessary. Uh, To talk about a moral failing is, is out of date, Now, our culture doesn't have a problem with with legalism as much as it does legalism's opposite, an overemphasis of grace to the point that that we believe it's not important. It's not important whether we we obey God or, or it's not important if we do the right thing. We can carelessly live our lives in a way that pleases ourselves, believing that, that by grace, God automatically forgives us those things that we do wrong. We almost rejoice in, in, the, in our brokenness and, and use it as an excuse. But you see, we have talked so much about the love of God that we can't imagine him also being there to judge our sin. So let me say in the beginning that, that rules are necessary. The laws of God are good. In fact, the purpose of those laws given to us by God are not to hinder us, and to make our lives more difficult. Instead, they're there to be guidelines to show us how to get the most out of life and how to enjoy it to its fullest. If you want to be an unhappy person, by all means, go out and break the laws of God. It's a formula for disaster. You see, God's laws are a result of his love. But we cannot mistake God's laws as being at the heart of our relationship with him. Neither can we make the mistake of thinking that we're made right with God by obeying the rules or or adding to them and and making it more difficult. We're not saved by never sinning. Uh, Rather, we're made right with God by admitting our sins, receiving his forgiveness as a free gift, and then repenting of them and moving forward. Now, now, all of this is made possible by the sacrifice that Christ made for us. And so we have to be sure that our relationship with God is a, is a relationship of love, a relationship of obedience, but, but not out of obligation, out of love. You see, the entire gospel is encapsulated In the verse that said, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, 
that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. That's John 3, 16. That's the verse that, that even people who aren't Christians, even people who don't really know anything about Christianity, they know that verse. God wants our love, and he wants someone like us to love. And you see, that's why we're here. Now, but there's always been those who have misunderstood and tried to take this relationship of love and turn it into a code of conduct. The Pharisees are the perfect example of this. I, I read the following in a commentary. The Pharisees were earnestly concerned with the law and with keeping its minutest detail. But the Pharisees tended to emphasize the oral law of the Torah, the first five books of the Old Testament. This oral law was composed of a vast number of interpretations and explanations of the Old Testament, which over the years continued to grow and grow and grow. And tragically, the oral law increasingly focused on trifling details. For instance, the command to not work on the Sabbath was expanded and illustrated with hundreds of explanations and exceptions. According to the Pharisees, a person was allowed to spit on rocky ground on the Sabbath, but they couldn't spit on soft or, or dusty earth because that spittle might move the dirt and that might make a furrow in it. And, and furrowing is, is plowing and, and then all of a sudden now they're working all because you spit in dirt. You see, that's legalism at its most ridiculous extreme. Paul told the Colossians, If with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the universe, why do you live as if you still belong to the world? Why do you submit to regulations? Do not handle, do not taste, do not touch. All these regulations refer to things that perish with us. They're simply human commands and teachings. You see, the biblical principle can be summed up as this. Keep these things in moderation. We don't want to take this beautiful relationship that we're, that we're privileged to have with God and arrange it in such a way and reduce it down to an absurd list of rules. Jesus has come to love us, not to turn us into religious robots who are all alike. St. Augustine used to say, love God and do as you please. By that, he did not mean that, that you could love God and sin all you want. No, he, he meant that when you love God, you pleasure in bringing God pleasure. It pleases you to do what pleases him. You don't need a list of rules to do that. It's an obedience that comes from our hearts. The second problem with legalism is, is that legalism turns people from encouragers into fault finders. I, I've known Christians who, who would never consider going to a movie, uh, dancing, or having a glass of wine, uh, but think nothing of being mean and critical of others. They come across as proud and arrogant, and cause conflict wherever they go. You see, fault-finding rule followers don't bring people to Christ. So often, the world sees us as finger-pointing, guilt-mongering fault-finders rather than people who are holding forth the world with the word of life. And I have to admit that, that, that often that's how I've come across in my life. We should be people who, who are more interested in helping others become transformed into the people God wants them to be instead of being the people who, who are making people feel guilty or shaming them. But you see, that's, that's often how the world sees us. It keeps bringing to my mind that, that picture of the church lady, Dana Carvey's character in Saturday Night Live. The world points us as rigid, rigid and, and joyless people. 
they think we don't know how to have a, have a good time. And these caricatures of Christians are, are not without some legitimacy. We've often become those finger-pointing people. Instead of wrapping our arms around one another and loving each other and leading each other to Christ, legalism turns us into that, those uptight people who turn others away from Christ rather than turning them to him. You see, our job is to be encouragers. How is it that, that our disposition can be so sour when the Bible says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. You see, it's the joy of God that, that should be our badge, our, our, our distinction, not our anger, not our judgmentality, not our finger pointing. We hear James respond to the intrusion of, of these legalists by saying, Therefore, I have reached the decision that we should not trouble the Gentiles who are turning to God. And he would say the same thing to us today. Don't make it difficult for someone to turn to God. Don't miss the obvious reality that, that someone is turning to God because you are so anxious to get them to observe laws and rules. Open the way up instead. Moral laws are important, and we'll get there soon enough. But don't have to, to try and hold the Holy Spirit out in front of people. The Holy Spirit can change people quite well without our help. In the end, the, the leaders of the church wrote a letter to the new Gentile converts and said, avoid idol worship, avoid sexual immorality. Other than that, Enjoy your new life with God. You see, when the church becomes a place filled with religious police, it's no longer safe to be genuine. It's no longer safe to be authentic. People start pretending to be someone that they're not and putting that mask on so that they won't be judged. Jesus warned us about this. He said, why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye? but you do not notice the log in your own. Now, another way that legalism is a problem for us is that it, it, it emphasizes outward conformity uh, rather than an inner transformation. It misses the entire point of Christian life. The point is for us to be in relationship with God and that relationship is to be enjoyed, not a set of rules to keep. At the heart of our Christian faith is a loving God who wants a relationship with us, a relationship not based in fear, but on love and trust. God loves us even when we fail. His purpose is not to get us to, to conform to this moral code written down on tablets of stone. Instead, his purpose is to change us inwardly so that our obedience comes from within. It comes from within our hearts. And in the scripture today, the, legal, the legalists who had arrived in Antioch are telling everyone to conform to the way of Moses. They missed out on the fact that, that God wanted and it already changed the heart of these people. These legalists, these Pharisees, these Jewish Christians, they were demanding these, these out, this outward conformity, and they didn't see that there had already been a transformation in their hearts. God's purpose has always been to, to create within us a heart that has love for him and that it's eager to do his will. God said through the prophet Jeremiah, this is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. But this is the covenant that, that, I will, that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts 
and I will be their God, and they will be my people. See, it's very hard for us to to get it into our heads that, that, that we don't have to be made, that we're not made right with God by being good people. If we could do that, we wouldn't need a Savior. We could just save ourselves. But we're made right with God through the atoning death and sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross. Nothing else. Nothing that we can do would ever be good enough to earn our forgiveness and entrance into heaven. The Bible puts it like this in the book of Ephesians. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. Not the result of works so that no one may boast. And Paul wrote to Titus. And he wrote this. He saved us not because of any works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy, through the waters and rebirth and renewal by the Holy Spirit. You see, Jesus isn't interested in our outward conformity to to a moral code. He's more interested in transforming our hearts. It's an inside job. And you see, once your heart is transformed, You'll fall in love with God, and you'll want to do his will. It won't be a burden. It won't be anything heavy to carry, but it'll become a delight. Demanding that people obey rules, can't even touch what God is really desiring to do in us. Just keeping the rules misses the point completely. I have a short story I want to share with you. A pilot was taking his family uh, on a light seaplane into British Columbia, and he attempted to land offshore in the ocean, and the plane's pontoons caught, and, and it flipped the plane into the icy waters. Now the pilot and his family managed to get out of the plane, but it quickly sank, and they had to swim half a mile to a small island And they had become injured in this crash. And they had to survive three cold days before they were found. Another plane saw them quite by accident as it was flying over. Now you see, an official search was initiated at the time of the accident because of the distress signal. But the searchers arrived at the scene just as the airplane was sinking and assumed that no one had survived. The man in charge of the rescue called off the search almost immediately. Now, when the family was eventually found and brought back to safety, the official in charge of rescuing the people defended his decision for calling off the search by saying they, the people who had been in the plane crash, did all the wrong things. They left the scene of the accident and left no indication which way they had gone. This was a person who could follow rules, but he could not follow the leading of his heart. Technically, he'd followed the rules that you should never leave the plane, and if you did, you had to leave a sign for others to to follow. So he had done everything technically right, but no one in their right mind would believe that he had actually done the right thing. I've known a lot of people who who are extremely good at following all the rules, uh, you know, dotting all the I's, crossing all the T's, but who miss the bigger picture, kindness, love, decency. You can be exactly right when it comes to following the rules and be completely wrong in following the heart of God. Jesus warned us not to be like the Pharisees whom he described in this way in Matthew 23. Therefore, do whatever they teach you and follow it, but do not do as they do, for they do not practice what they teach. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on the shoulders of others, but they themselves are unwilling to lift a finger to move them.
You see, we need to make sure that we're not caught up as the world is with this anything goes mentality when it comes to our walk with Christ. But we also need to make sure that we're not overburdening people with legalism, with things that were never meant for them to bear in the first place. If people need conviction, the Holy Spirit can do it. And once they've been brought into the fold, once they've grown up, if they step out of line, then yes, absolutely, it's our job to come in and, and lovingly correct them. And so let us come from a heart full of love and a desire to see others succeed. Let's pray. Holy Father, we thank you. We thank you for, for all that you do for us, all that you do in us. And God, we desire to do your will, not out of obligation, God. And if there are any of us here, God, who, who are only following the rules because that's what we should do, then God, I, I pray that you would soften their hearts. And God, if that's me, God, soften my heart. Help me to follow you out of love, not out of obligation, not out of fear, but God, because I, I, I want to bring you joy. Father, may this church, may our homes, may this community, and may this world come to know you for who you are, the God who loves us, the God who desires us, and the God who desires for our lives to be transformed by what you've done for us. We thank you, Father. In your son Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. All right, brothers and sisters, let's sing one more song of praise.
All right, brothers and sisters, I invite you to put your hands out, palms up to receive the benediction this morning. This is found in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 16 and 17. Now, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who loved us and through grace gave us eternal comfort and good hope, comfort your hearts and strengthen them in every good work and word. Go in peace, brothers and sisters. You are loved.